Hello, everyone. Welcome to Serge's February webinar, Hope for Growth, a Gospel-Centered Approach to the Enneagram. My name is Anna Madsen, and I'm one of the program leaders here on Serge's Renewal Team. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Just a bit of background in case you're new to Serge. We're a cross-denominational international mission sending agency, and we're committed to keeping the gospel of grace central to all that we do. We know that we never outgrow our own need for grace, even as we take the good news of that grace to the nations. And we trust that the power of God for mission is uniquely expressed in the lives of weak people who know that they need Jesus every minute of every day. For us, these webinars are just one way that we as a mission seek to nurture a culture of grace in Christian communities in North America and all around the world. Now, just for a few housekeeping items today, after the presentation, we'll be able to take some of your questions. So if at any point in the hour, feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function in the Zoom toolbar. Uh, we'll take as many of those as we can uh, until our time together is up. And you may also see the Zoom functions for chat and raise hand, but we are not going to be using those functions today. We're just using the Q&A function. And it might put some of your minds at ease to know that while you can see the speakers on the screen, neither we at Surge nor other attendees can see you. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for today, Beth and Jeff McCord. After serving more than 20 years in pastoral ministry together, Beth and Jeff co-founded Your Enneagram Coach, which exists to help people see themselves with astonishing clarity so they can break free from self-condemnation, fear, and shame by knowing and experiencing the unconditional love, forgiveness, and freedom in Jesus Christ. Beth serves as the organization's lead content creator, and Jeff is the chief executive officer and a coach. Beth and Jeff have also authored numerous books, including their best-selling book, Becoming Us, Using the Enneagram to Create a Thriving Gospel-Centered Marriage, and their upcoming book, More Than Your Number, A Christ-Centered Approach to Becoming Aware of Your Internal World, to be released this September. They've been married for 26 years, and they have two adult children, Nate and Libby. Beth and Jeff, welcome. It is so great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I'll just turn it over to you, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share today. Great. Thanks. Um, it's, we're so honored to be here. Oh, man, we really are. Search played such a significant role. Ever since our time back in seminary, when we found out about you guys, and it was mm -hmm. 2001 yep. in St. Louis, so we are delighted to be here. Yep, my first uh, introduction for myself was reading Rosemary's book, uh, From Fear to Freedom, and I devoured that it. That book is destroyed I, <laughs> with her marks in it. <laughs> I, I think every word has been underlined at one point or another. Yes. Oh, well, that's so. fantastic. And just hearing you introduce, like, man, like you've done a lot of work over the past few years. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Well, we're delighted uh, you all have decided to join us to talk a little bit about uh, this tool called the Enneagram and what that could mean for your own life, uh, your ministry, as well as uh, your relationships. And so I'm going to share the screen here and get us started. We're going to dive right in. Boom, 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 boom. You got to hit play. There we go. All righty, friends. Well, we're super thankful that you're here. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Enneagram, one of the best ways that you can learn more is by heading over to your Enneagram coach on Instagram. We've got a community of a couple hundred thousand people. We release numerous videos and posts every day, just information about all the various Enneagram types. And so you can find out more there. Uh, in addition is our podcast, which is going to be super fun because uh, the studio you're seeing now is actually going to become uh, our video podcast that we'll also be releasing on uh, YouTube uh, starting in March, uh, which is our new approach based upon our new book uh, that was mentioned earlier, More Than Your Number. Uh, we've had over a million downloads in our first year. We could have never have dreamed what that would mean that this 
gospel-centered approach to a personality tool would actually reach globally. And so it has been a sincere privilege and honor to be able to well, uh, share And I think it others. just, it really just speaks to the fact that we really do want to know who we are, but we also want people to know whose they are. And that's the goal of your Enneagram coach. That's right. Well, as it was read earlier, uh, so well about our mission, and I just want to point out one significant truth about our mission as an organization. So we we reach millions of people every month. Uh, we have close to 2,000 coaches in over 25 different countries. Uh, we've got a team of 30 men and women a- across the United States who help us to do all these things. But here's one central truth about us. Um, Our goal is for people to see themselves with astonishing clarity so they can break free from self-condemnation, fear, and shame by knowing and experiencing the unconditional love, forgiveness, and freedom in Christ. But there's one significant thing that's not in that mission statement. It's not the Enneagram. Right. (laughs) Because the Enneagram, although is the tool that we use, it's the gospel and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that changes us. Yeah. The Enneagram is much more like an x-ray that reveals things, but it can't fix things. And we need a physician for that. And so what we're going to be doing during this time is just a brief overview of all the nine Enneagram types. And then we're going to give you a helpful tool for how the Enneagram can give you insight into not only how you relate to yourself, how you relate to God, but then also how you relate to others. Yeah. And, you know, as we kind of jump into that, um, you know, as a being a, like a very helpful tool, you know, we're going to break this down. So for those of you that are out there and you're like, I already know about the Enneagram, I don't need this basic <laughs> stuff. Just hang on. Cause what we're going to show you kind of in the second part is most likely something you've never seen because it's our own proprietary um, Enneagram content that's going to really help you in any relationship that you're in. So definitely hang in there. And if you're new, guess what? We're going to on-ramp you by taking you through some of these quick basics. So what is the Enneagram? Let me steal this from you real quick. Um, so the Enneagram is a really um, amazing tool, kind of like an internal GPS. It's going to help you to know why you think, feel, and behave in particular ways, according to your personality type. So what you want to think of the Enneagram is that it's got nine valid perspectives because there's nine basic types. And you just want to to realize that we all see the world through a different lens. And that's really important because I don't know if you've had this in marriage relationships, your children, coworkers, whoever. We are so unified in our vision of reality, (laughs) Beth. That, (laughs) That so often we think everyone sees the world like this, like we're seeing it the same way. And so then we get annoyed and frustrated. Like, why did you do that? Or why did you say that? Or why aren't you doing it the right way? <laughs> the, my way. Um, but we come to the world really seeing everyone observing, interpreting, and then reacting to the world, or they should the same way. But here's the reality is that we all have different perspectives and lenses on. There are nine basic ways of seeing, interpreting, and reacting to the world. And it really speaks to the body of Christ. God did not all create us all in uniform. Like we're all one way of seeing the world. We have one gifting, one passion. What we do with Christ, that's for sure. But gifts, passions, desires, all of those things, God gave us uniqueness. And the Enneagram really helps to explain that at the core level. So remember, the Enneagram is all about the why. It's not about your outward behaviors. It's about your heart condition and why you do what you do. And that's really important as we really explore it from a gospel centered perspective, uh, because God is looking at our heart and our heart motivations. And so what we have done, um, Don Richard Riso is one of the early on teachers of the Enneagram, and he developed a concept called levels of development. And I enjoyed that. But what I felt like it was missing was, well, yeah, we can be healthy, average and unhealthy, but how do we see that through the lens of the gospel? And so what we have done is we've taken it and brought the gospel to it. So what we want is we want to understand the levels of alignment of our heart to the gospel. So at any given point of any day, as we all know, there are times that we're doing really well and times that we're not. And the Enneagram can help us to understand where we're at at a heart level condition based on the levels of alignment to the gospel. So let me explain what this looks like. 
So when we're healthy, we're going to be aligned with the truth of the gospel. We know, believe, and trust who we are in Christ and our identity in Christ. And when we're in that place, we're living as his beloved child, right? The overflow of our heart, that is who we are. And we just live it out in all of our relationships, which is truly amazing personally and for all of those around us. Now, there are times, and we're all aware of this, (laughs) that we start to get misaligned and we start to live in our own strength. It's kind of autopilot. Now, this is where we know God is great and sovereign and doing wonderful things. And let's say we, we think that all over here, but there's this one little area, maybe more than one, um, where we're like, I know he's doing great work over here, but I'm going to start controlling this because I want a certain outcome. Um, and we may not even realize that our heart has started to wander, but it does. And we get misaligned with the truth of the gospel, thinking that we have to control, fix, mend, whatever it is, apart from God. And that's when we start to get misaligned with the truth of the gospel. And then there's times in our life where we're really unhealthy and we're completely out of alignment with the truth of the gospel. And this is where we're living as an orphan. Now we're not an orphan. That's the beautiful thing about the gospel is that the gospel says that it's Jesus Christ, perfect life, death, and resurrection that have taken away our sins and applied his righteousness to us. Therefore, it's all based on him and through him. So when we are misaligned and out of alignment, thinking we're all alone in life, we've got to figure this out on our own. That is actually not truth. It's a false belief. Now we'll act out of that belief, but what's true is when we're in Christ, we are always his beloved. And so what we're wanting to do with the Enneagram, as we can see, you know, when Beth is doing great, here's kind of some of the internal uh, manifestations and the external manifestations. That's great. Let's praise God. But then there's going to be things that uh, Beth's struggling, Beth's getting misaligned and it's harming herself and others. And it's there that we want to remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel and surrender and depend on the Holy Spirit to bring us back into alignment. So that our mind, heart are believing and trusting who we are in Christ. So we live that out. So again, we're always his beloved child, but let's take note of when our mind and our heart wander from that truth. And that's what we're here for. So when you're internally healthy and aligned, you're going to see that fruit relationally. But when your heart is misaligned and autopilot and unhealthy, your relationships are going to suffer those consequences. So that is really kind of our heart behind the Enneagram is again, our heart condition and where, where is our heart condition, whether aligned, misaligned, or out of alignment, not to bring shame, self-condemnation and fear, but instead to look at the hope that we already have in the gospel, in Christ, what he has done on our behalf. Let's get our eyes fixated on that truth and everything is going to radically change. So how can we look at our personality types or find our personality types? Well, if there's one thing I really recommend that you guys focus in on, whether you are an Enneagram fanatic or you're just beginning out, is the core motivations because everything hinges on the core motivations. This is why you think, feel, and behave in particular ways. There are four core motivations. You have a core fear, desire, weakness, and longing. I'm going to take you through those real quick here. So we have a core fear. This is what you're always running away from. You're trying to avoid and you're trying to prevent it from happening at all costs. You'll know it when it happens because your whole body is going to react to it. Now you have a core desire and this is what you're always striving for, believing that if you obtain this great fulfillment in life, like, oh, this is amazing. Life is perfect now. Like you think that it's going to actually happen here on earth. Now we have a core weakness. Now the core weakness, other teachers will call it the passion, maybe the deadly sin, but for us, we call it the core weakness because it's the main thing that we're always wrestling with, the main weakness. And it's like our Achilles heel, that thorn in our side. But what we want to recognize is that, you know, in second Corinthians 12, seven through 10, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on upon me for when I am weak, then I am strong. So we all are going to struggle with this core weakness for the rest of our lives until we get to heaven or when Christ comes. But 
that doesn't mean that it has to deter us from seeing the gospel. In fact, it should point us back to him when we recognize that it's popping up once again, and we get to depend on him and allow him to work in and through us to bring us hope and joy. Now, the core longing is the message your heart longs to hear. Now, many people have committed two, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah 2.13 says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, cistern, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now, this is such a key verse because here we have the spring of living water right here, but we're like, uh, oh, you know what, I think I'm going to go dig these uh, wells that have no water in it. I'm going to put some water in it. It's going to get stagnant. Oh, and by the way, they're broken. So they don't even hold the gross, stinky, stagnant water. But I'm going to keep doing this time and time again. That's what we call idols. But we keep doing that. And yet Christ is right here. And he satisfies our core longing. And that's so important for us to recognize is that we're trying to get our core longing met in relationships, careers, materialism, all these other things, but it's him who completely satisfies. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the core motivations for all nine types. And if you don't know your type, really kind of take note of these core motivations. If you want um, kind of a PDF with all of them together, uh, you can go to your forward slash core motivations. But we're going to go over these and these should help you to solidify your main type. And we do use all nine types to varying degrees, but there is one that reigns supreme. And that's what the one you're going to want to find first. All right. So here we go with type one. Type one is the principled reformer. Now, this is funny because I'm looking at it going, I don't know why, but the principled reformer, the word reformer oh, is I, off. I'm sure type one's already saw it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm laughing because I'm like, of course it's going to happen to the type one. <laughs> I mean, I literally went through this whole slide deck to make it, it like, okay, I'm going to find all the little errors. It, it's fonts. When, whenever we brought the presentation onto this computer, I think oh, so. Right. This is a different computer we than my computer. We were not intending to ruin your day today. We are so sorry. <laughs> so we're, we're offering you opportunities of growth. <laughs> opportunities to practice your growth. <laughs> so, okay. So type ones, the principled reformers, you fear being bad, evil, corruptible, and wrong, but you desire to have integrity, to be good, um, um, ethical, sorry, you guys are pictures in the way, there we go, um, ethical, moral, and right but you have a core weakness of resentment. And this is where you're repressing your anger that leads to continual frustration and dissatisfaction with yourself, others, and the world for not being perfect. Now, I'm not gonna go over it very much, but type ones have a loud inner critic. It's like a megaphone. It's constantly pointing out what is wrong, assaulting the type one into making sure it gets fixed and it won't let up until it does. It's constantly berating. But what they long to hear is you are good. Now, the great news is, is that Christ satisfies our core longing, right? So type ones, you are completely forgiven. Your past, present, future sins are no more in Christ. And secondly, his full and perfect righteousness has been credited to you. Therefore, when he looks at you, he says you are good, not based on what you have done, based on what he has done, because his righteousness is now on you. Type twos, you are, it's doing it for all of them. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Oh, that's great. Um, this is the world of grace. That's right. It's a tech gremlin. <laughs> yeah. They're everywhere. We were praying against the tech we gremlins. We were. But One snuck in. I think God just wants us to be flexible Oh, and yeah. go with it. That's okay. Right. So um, type twos, you're the nurturing supporter. Now, because <laughs> you get scared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the core fear of the type two is being unloved, worthless, needy, rejected, and unwanted. But you desire to be loved, wanted, and appreciated. But you struggle with the core longing of pride. Now, what pride means here is that you're denying your own needs and emotions while focusing the, on the emotions and needs of others. And then once you see it, you're gonna confidently insert your helpful support in hopes that others will see and show you appreciation for it. Because that feels like love to the, to the twos. Twos walk in a room, they have these antenna and they can sense and feel all of the needs and emotions. And they kind of hone in on a person or a group and they make sure 
that things are taken care of because they're so afraid of others seeing them as being selfish and being rejected. So they want to ignore themselves and focus on others to be appreciated. Now, that what they long to hear is you are wanted and loved. Now, the good news is that Christ satisfies that, right? Because you are loved unconditionally. Now, if you're not a, a type two, you might be like, yeah, true. Well, guess what? For a type two, that's a really hard word, unconditionally. You don't have to serve, advise, help in order to be loved. Christ loves you exactly where you're at. Now, the second thing is, is that you are wanted and pursued by Christ. He's the hound of heaven. And he comes towards you with a jealous love that is unending. He so loves you for right where you're at. Now, type threes, can't see the, the name again. <laughs> it's the admirable <laughs> achiever. Uh, everything in me wants to pause and correct it all. Yeah. Cause it <laughs> I know, but you can't because <laughs> you can't. That's where, right. where it's at is actually a little more challenging, which is kind oh, of interesting. Yeah. Okay. So the admirable achievers. Now you guys, the core fear is being a failure, incompetent, worthless, and inefficient, but you desire to be successful, efficient, valuable, and admired, but you struggle with the core weakness of deceit. Now, what it means here is that you're deceiving yourself into believing that you're only the image you present to others. You're embellishing the truth by putting on a polished persona for everyone to see and admire. So what the threes feel is that I have to achieve and others need to see it in order to be loved and valued and admired. So a lot of times they'll kind of show you what, the, what they've done, like, Hey, look what I've done, or here's this, or they want the, they want to know that you have seen and appreciated, um, and admire their accomplishments for them. It's kind of like the saying, uh, for a place kicker, you're good as your last kick for them is you're good as your last success or achievement. So they check it off like, yes, oh, now off the next thing, the next thing, and it never ends. And it's exhausting. And it's all about the image that they portray to others. But what they long to hear is you are loved for simply being you. And that is the truth in Christ because he knows you exactly for who you are. It's really hard for a three to be exposed for any kind of weakness or um, failure. And that's who we are as humans, right? Like we're sinners and that can be really hard, but Christ sees all of that and loves you for who you are. But not only that, your value and worth are the fully rest in Christ's perfect accomplishments on your behalf. And therefore you don't need to achieve anymore to get the status that you are hoping for, the love you are hoping for. It's secure in Christ. Now type fours, hey, it did it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the introspective individualist. Now you fear being inadequate, emotionally cut off, defective and mundane. It is interesting that if fours long to not feel defective, their title and they was be right. They want to be unique and different. They are. They, they are. Oh, I That's love right. that. That's special. <laughs> okay. So for you guys, the core desire is to be unique, special, authentic, significant, and original. Now you struggle with the core weakness of envy and envy here means that you're feeling that there's something tragically flawed or something foundational is missing inside you and that others possess qualities that you lack. Now fours have a great uh, range of emotions. And what this means is, is that fours feel that there's something really missing. Think of a puzzle that you've put together and you're so excited to get it finished. And it's like, ah, it's going to be amazing. And then there's that missing piece. And you're like, are you serious? Like it was going to be great, but and there's this missing piece and you look around and everyone else's puzzles are complete and finished and glorious and beautiful. And it's like, man, I'm longing for this missing piece. Where is it? And that's how the four feels inside that there's something missing. So what they long to hear is you are seen and loved for exactly who you are, special and unique. And fours, man, are you seen and loved for exactly for who you are by Christ? He's the one that created you. He knows you better than you know yourself and he delights in you. And therefore you are understood and known by him. Fours feel very misunderstood by others, but Christ knows you intimately and loves you. Now type fives, you're the analytic, analytical investigator, and you fear being ignorant, 
annihilated, invaded, obligated, and incapable, but you desire to be comp competent, capable, knowledgeable, and insightful. And you're going to struggle with the uh, core weakness of avarice. This is where you're feeling that you lack inner resources and that too much interaction with others is going to lead to catastrophic depletion internally. So you're going to hold on to your resources and minimize your needs. Now, the type four is how you can think, I mean, sorry, the type five is how you can think about it is think about a cell phone battery. You know how all, most of us plug it in at night so that by the morning we have hundred percent for the rest of the, the next day. Well, the type five, they plug it in, they wake up and there's 20 to 25% interactive battery life for the whole day. So they're going to ration out that time or, or what they have with others. And so you might see them pulling back and it can feel like, oh, they're being cold and standoffish or why do they need so much time alone? They need time alone to process their thoughts and their feelings and to recharge. Now for the fives, your core longing is to hear your needs are not a problem. And Christ, what he says, how he satisfies you is that your needs are seen and taken care of by him. He is the God of the universe. Your needs are not a problem for him. It is a joy and delight to provide for you like the good shepherd does. And secondly, Christ is the spring of living water and he replenishes your empty internal reservoir. Now type sixes are the faithful guardians. Sorry about the word. Um, they fear being without support, guidance, security, and being blamed and abandoned. Now they desire security, guidance, and support, but they also struggle with the core weakness of anxiety. Now every type can be anxious, um, but where this is coming from is that they're scanning the horizon of life, trying to predict and prevent negative outcomes, especially worst case scenarios. Now they're remaining in this constant state of apprehension and worry. And the reason is, remember we talked about the type ones having one loud inner critic. Well, the sixes have an inner committee chiming in from all different directions, giving different thoughts that could go down this direction and that direction. So there's a lot of self doubt that comes up because it's like, well, which one should I follow? So they look outside themselves for that security guidance and support from those that they can trust. Now, what they long to hear is you are safe and secure. And in Christ, he satisfies this because God is all powerful and you are safe in his care. And we know that so well, and we're so thankful. Yes, we may not know day to day if we're safe or not, but we do know in, eternally we are safe in what Christ has accomplished. And with that, the second point is the Holy Spirit <clears throat> gives you clarity and certainty in a confusing and chaotic world. Now type sevens, you're the enthusiastic optimist and you fear being trapped in emotional pain, deprived, limited, bored, and missing out. You have the core desire to be happy, satisfied, and fully content, but you struggle with the, <coughs> I'm losing my voice. You're struggling with the core weakness of gluttony. And this is where you're feeling a great emptiness inside. Sorry, let me take a drink. <laughs> I don't know where the frog's coming from, uh, feeling a great emptiness inside and having this insatiable desire to fill yourself up with experiences and stimulations and hope that um, the feelings inside you will be completely satisfied. But it's kind of like <clears throat> an empty bucket inside where you have holes at the bottom. The sevens are constantly trying to fill with all of these amazing stimulation and excitement but it just feels like it's never going to happen. What they long to hear is you will be taken care of and Christ completely satisfies you and gives you a content heart. He is your portion and your fill and he needs, or your needs are fully taken care of by Christ. And that's like the spring of living water, right? You can drink as much as your heart desires to be full. Do you want me to take type yeah, eight? Like you take second. type eight. So like, give my voice a second. Fantastic. I don't know where it's going on. Alrighty, Type Eights, uh, the passionate protector. <clears throat> oh, now I've got it. I know. <laughs> and we're passing it along. This is great. Um, type Eights fear being weak, powerless, controlled, harmed, and at the mercy of injustice. They desire to protect themselves and those in their inner circle. Now, the core weakness of the eight is lust or excess. Now, don't think of this in regards to intimate lust. But it's really about excess uh, and experience. They constant de constantly desire intensity, control, power, pushing themselves willfully onto the lives of others 
and people uh, to get what they desire. And the last thing that they long for is that you will not be betrayed. Now, eights are, and we live in Nashville, Tennessee now, but we spent many years in Kansas City, St. Louis, and also Illinois. Uh, eights have this uh, moniker that goes around or a stereotype that they're bulldozers. And although that does capture something of the eight, the reality is, is that they're much more like a snowplow. And if you've lived in the Midwest, Midwest or snowy regions, you recognize how beneficial snowplows are. Snowplows can move masses of massive amounts of snow so that people can commerce can travel. And without them, the roads would be totally unsafe. But there's always in the winter months, these commercials that happen uh, because don't leave your car on the side of the road because when they're plowing snow, they might plow over a car. <laughs> Well, uh, so that's why a bulldozer doesn't quite capture it because eights have this amazing strength to go before us and to lead us. Uh, and we all know that sometimes when we get in their way, um, that they can actually nick us and maybe overrun people's voices or opinions and desires. Well, all of that's being generated out of this idea that you will not be betrayed. This idea that you alone must take care of yourself and shield yourself from any kind of betrayal. Well, here's the reality of what Christ has done. Uh, Christ is the one who has promised that he will never leave nor betray you. He was the one who sat at the table with these men who would eventually betray him one by one and yet move towards them in love. We are weak, but he has promised that he is the one who is strong. He is our strong tower. He is our help. He is the one who will protect, protect us. And that though in this world we will face trouble, he has overcome the world. Do you want to do type nine? Okay, we'll see. <laughs> so I'm a type nine. So let's see how far we can get. Um, so we're the peaceful accommodators. Yeah, I don't know if I can do it. Um, so the core fear of the nine is being in conflict, tension, loveless, separate, overlooked, shut out, and in discord with others. We hate tension and conflict. We desire to have inner stability and peace of mind, but we struggle with the core weakness of sloth. Now, this isn't a physical laziness, though we do like our cozy comforts. Um, this has to do more with the internal world. Remaining in an idealistic world to keep the peace, we're falling asleep to ourselves, our passions, desires, abilities. And what we do is we go along to get along. So we negate ourselves in order to keep that peace and harmony. Um, and so for the nines, we think it's admirable to humble ourselves by ignoring ourselves and just focusing on everyone else. But then we're negating the very gift that God has given us, which is ourselves, to bless others with the good news of Christ in the way he has designed us. So we want to wake up to our passions and desires and calling the way God has created us and bless the world in the way that he sees fit. Now, what we long to hear is our presence matters and our presence does matter. I mean, Jesus Christ left his throne to come to earth, to live a brutal life perfectly, to die, to be buried so that, and to rise again so that he can give us his righteousness and bring us back into relationship with him. That it totally 100% shows us that our presence matters. He saw us and came for us. Therefore, our voice, our passions, our voice matters. Our voice, our passions <laughs> matter. matter. And we need to assert our voices in a humble but strong way to reflect God and who, who he is and what he has done on our behalf. Well, this next part, we're going to spend a couple of minutes in talking about the idea of the dance. Now, this is where we take the idea of the core motivations of each Enneagram type and now apply it to our relational lives. And how does it express itself? Well, what do we mean by the dance? The dance is simply the relational dynamics between two Enneagram types. Now, you'll notice that when you look at our Becoming Us book, it's particularly applied to a marital relationship but we're only dealing with two types. So it applies to any relationship that you're in, whether it's parenting or whether uh, it's coworkers, you're working with other team members or friends. So uh, this applies to any relationship. Well, John Gottman, the marriage resor uh, researcher here in the US discovered that 70% of our conflicts do not have a right or wrong answer. 70%. It's pretty amazing. That it, it's a lot. And what it came down to is it came down to personality and preference. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Jesus told us this, um, that the heart of the problem is the problem of our hearts. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we understand what's happening inside, it's going to help us to understand uh, the battle that's internal and why we are battling externally to have those needs met. Mm -hmm. But if our hearts aligned with the truth of the gospel, we're going to see the fruits and how we relate to one another. That's the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. But when our hearts misaligned with the truth of the gospel, our relationships are going to suffer the consequences. As, as Paul would say, why are you biting and devouring one another? Um, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the heart, the battle that wages war in your heart, James chapter 4? Well, what we tried to capture is the inside of the Enneagram and how it aligns biblically with how we're instructed by Jesus and created an illustration to be able to capture this. I want to remind you of the core motivations, core fear, desire, weakness, and longing. And here's the illustration of the dance. You'll notice there's a line uh, down the, through the middle of it, behaviors on top, heart condition on the bottom. You also know core motivations. They're at the heart of each side of the infinity loop. And that's the fuel that's driving the dynamics, okay? So how it works. Number one, I think or feel based upon the lens by which I'm viewing the incident or dynamic. It could be a misbehaving child, uh, a work decision, uh, a household chore, whatever it is, but I'm going to see it through the lens of my type. And based upon my interpretation, I react and I do something. I might say something. I might actually do something. Well, that has an impact on, let's say, Beth. And she in, feels it and thinks about it through the lens of her core motivations. And then she reacts. Okay. Now, around and around this goes, I want to apply this uh, very quickly here for the type six, which is me, the loyal guardian, and type nine, the peaceful mediator. <laughs> and I want to specifically uh, point out the idea of abandonment. There's a fear in the six's heart that any kind of disengagement is the beginning of the end. And so it could be emotional or it could be physical. And there are memories that I even have core memories that speak to this, about why abandonment would be such an issue for me. And Beth, what is most important that you want to highlight here? Yeah, <clears throat> losing connection with others, especially right. around conflict. So when an incident happens, I fear the other person may abandon the relationship. This could be Beth doesn't want to engage with me on something. Uh, this could be we have a different opinion on a matter or if we were going to have conflict that inevitably leads to being uh, emotionally reactive while trying to per preserve relational security. I want to get this worked out as soon as possible because I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I may get big, I may get detached, but all of those are ways to try to gain security. Number three is uh, how that lands on Beth is that whenever I start to get a little big, she fears the tension. She can feel the tension before the conflict even begins. And she feels it in her body, the conflict and the disruption that she experiences uh, to relational harmony. And then lastly, she becomes overwhelmed and withdraws from the conflict. Mm -hmm. But now let's insert the gospel into this. What if I came to the relationship with a heart that is at rest and is in rhythm with the truth of who Christ says I am and what he intends to provide for me. Well, that gives me a restful heart. And my, I, I hand over my anxieties and fears and I move towards Beth with more ease and less intensity. And then what that does is that that actually sets up Beth uh, to respond in an entirely different way, because if her heart is at rest with the truth of the gospel, it's going to provide her with a sense of peace and harmony. Even though I may be disorganized, that doesn't mean that she has done anything wrong or that she needs to get disorganized. And then lastly, uh, she's able to stay engaged even when the dynamics of the relationship are actually uncomfortable. So you can see how the idea of coupling the idea of the, the insights of the Enneagram with uh, faith working itself out in love actually can transform our relationships. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're interested and you want to learn more about and gain some more insights into your own heart as well as to your relationships, you can head over to becomingus.com. There's a button there at the top that it's called a marriage plan. But again, it's just a 
comparing two relational uh, dynamics, you put in your Enneagram number and the uh, whoever it is that you're thinking of, and you're going to get a six page report about the relational dynamics for your specific um, couple type. And, you know, for those that are here, they get a free book, right? That's right. We're giving away free copies of a digital uh, digital copy of our Becoming Us book. Now, the difference is, is that the book does not have the dance in it. That's only in our courses for each couple type combination. There's 45 courses, one for each of you. Um, And so we just wanted to make that clear that though you're going to get the book, which has an amazing amount of information, especially the last third of it, Um, We want you to know that the dance part is actually in the course at that website. Awesome. Well, we'll turn it over to you guys for some time in uh, Q&A. Wow. You guys, thank you so much. Uh, That was an incredibly um, encouraging as well as um, practical presentation, not to mention just clear presentation of the gospel. I mean, I just, I could feel my heart welling up every time. Um, we were able to, to talk about um, what Jesus has done for us and secured for us and how that applies to who we are. Um, just so amazing. Um, so we are going to transition into our Q&A time. And uh, just a reminder, we've already had some questions come in, which is great. Uh, but at any time, you can submit your questions through that Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar. And we'll just take them until we run out of time, um, great. which that is, great. is great. So, um, so let's see, uh, we've already gotten some in and, um, kind of the first question, um, today is, um, about, you know, what if you, um, don't, what if I don't like my type that I take mm-hmm. the assessment and, um, it, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't, it either doesn't feel like me or, um, or I, I don't like it. Can I change it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, do, what do you guys think about that? Well, you know, all of the assessments out there are going to be at best 70 to 80% accurate. And that's because it's asking you why you do the things that you do. And if you don't know yourself very well, you might not be answering it as clearly as you can. That's why you still want to focus on those core motivations. Um, So if you get, let's say a type one, but you're like, gosh, I think I resonate with three more. Well, take a look at that. And maybe that's true. We also have a mistyping guide that's free, your Enneagram forward slash mistypes. And you can kind of see between two numbers, like, oh, the three and the one, here's the biggest differences. Yeah, I am a three instead of a one. But a lot of types have different parts of it that are lookalikes to each other. And that's why it can be confusing. But again, you wanna get to the motivations, not outward behaviors, because both threes and ones can look like perfectionist in some aspects, but again, it's why they do it that's important. Now, once you find your type, yeah, you're gonna see that there's unbecoming characteristics of your type and it is going to be, in your face. The Enneagram shows us at our very best and also at our very worst or what could be our very worst. And that can be really hard because we're so familiar with that not so great part. And often the human flesh and the enemy wants to harp on that with shame and condemnation and fear. That's why we're here. Because yes, we obviously want to become more like Christ in the way he's designed us. But we also want to recognize that we have these common, um, you know, where we veer off course and fall into common pitfalls of shame and self-condemnation. So what we want to do is we want to be honest with ourselves that, yes, when we are out of alignment or misaligned, we're going to live out these characteristics, but we don't have to use them to harm ourselves. We can use them as an aha moment to get back on the right path. We call it the rumble strip, you know, like on the highway. We want to use that to wake ourselves up and get the, our car, ourselves, back into alignment by seeing the truth of the gospel, admitting where we may have sinned, ask the Holy Spirit to work in and through us to become more like Christ um, and, and praise him for the, the fact that we are his beloved child all the time. So yes, you're going to have moments of that shame popping up and that fear and that all of those feelings, but use that as a tool and a resource to get you back on the right path. Now, We do not change our main type. Our main type will remain the main type forever. But when you get to know the Enneagram further, there's lots of layers. It shows you how different 
types are going to pop up for different reasons, whether healthy or unhealthy. And that's really what our next book is all about. You, uh, more than your number. And you can actually pre-order it now on Amazon and our podcast that we're going to start March 22nd. We're actually going to walk five months through how you can understand the different parts of your heart that do pop up, whether in a misaligned or aligned manner. So that will be really helpful for those out there, not only to hear about your type um, in a fuller form, but how to help you to see the misaligned and how to have a vision and a hope for how the Holy Spirit can guide you um, in an aligned ma manner. Did you have anything you want to add? Uh, <clears throat> just a pastoral thought that um, if it's true that we were adopted as sons and daughters from the beginning of time and that Acts uh, tells us that God's chosen the time and places and even the very breath that we breathe. And then that we've been knit together in our mother's womb with good works prepared in advance for us to do. And matter of fact, even God's not done yet because he will carry it on to completion um, for what he has begun. So to hold, we oftentimes will hold in contempt what God has actually made uh, and we miss the joy of coming to recognize our own sense of glory, having been made in the image of God, but done so in a unique way with a unique expression for his kingdom. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yes. Um, and just to confirm, uh, several folks have said, you know, where do I go to figure out what type I am, uh, on your website, um, your Enneagram coach.com, um, that the, the, yep. the basic test yep. is there. The test, big and it's button free. Right there in the yep. top right hand corner. It's yeah. totally free. Yeah. So, um, you know, along with all the other resources you've mentioned, uh, you know, if folks are just starting out and want to find out yeah. what they are. Um, and you can have great confidence. I mean, we've had close to 3 million people take it. Uh, thousands of people take it each day. So it, um, you'll get results and it'll give you some clarity and, and then you'll get some follow-up emails to help you to define your, uh, your type. That's great. Well, um, you know, since since Surge has um, workers all over the world, um, and we have uh, some of those folks tuning in today, uh, which is awesome. Um, a couple of them have have uh, have asked, you know, how how does this work cross culturally? Um, mm -hmm. You know, is this just an American way of <laughs> yeah. seeing things, or or um, you know, have you done much work to to see like does this does do these ideas kind of pan out uh, yeah. as as you move into other cultures? Yeah. I mean, that's a really great question. And it, it it's not about race. It's not about gender. It's not about ethnicity. Yeah, ethnicity and culture. It is literally about the motivations of our heart. Now it may manifest a little bit differently in different cultures um, and different cultural aspects might influence how a person operates through their um, core motivations. For instance, if you're in a culture where time is very lucid and yet let's say you're a type one and you're like, everyone should be on time. Well, it's just not going to happen in that culture. And so you will have had to learn how to adjust in that culture, but you're still going to have that core motivation and desire. So we just want to make sure that, that, that is aware, but the actual tool can be used anywhere. And it's not that girls are this type and boys are this type. That's not it at all. Now we might um, operate from our core in a more feminine or masculine way or none at all. So we just want to recognize that um, there isn't, you know, that it can be used anywhere. Just well, recognize those things. Historically, the Enneagram was actually more popular in various other countries right. before mm -hmm. it came to the United States. And yeah. so this wasn't something that originated here. It actually originated in a variety of other settings uh, in other countries. And so it still be true. And certain uh, cultures will prefer certain tendencies of types. Mm, uh, right. So here in the States, uh, even within certain people groups, there are certain attributes uh, that we've started to discover mm -hmm. uh, that maybe in white cultures, they don't appreciate as much, uh, but maybe in black cultures, they do. Yeah. And so you'll find some of the nuances, but the core motivations are still the same. Yeah. That's great. And that doesn't, just because one culture, let's say, esteems a type or several types more than others doesn't mean that those types are actually better. It just happens that that culture finds it more um, better for their culture or um, 
pleasurable or whatever it is. So just recognize that as well. That's great. Um, and since you kind of referenced the origins um, of the Enneagram, um, uh, a few folks have just said, you know, um, they, they're a little bit skeptical just because, um, you know, they've kind of heard uh, there's, there's been some, um, you know, attribution to the occult um, and kind of how this got started. And, um, you know, what, it, what does it mean that you're taking a gospel centered approach um, if, you know, the origins of this are, are, are evil? Um, and I know that you guys have, have thought a lot about this. So I um, wanted to give yeah. you a chance to talk about that. Well, we hit, we wrestled with the question for a number of years. We found out about the Enneagram in 2001, uh, prior to it becoming so popular, particularly within the evangelical church here uh, in the States. Um, and it is true that the Enneagram did not come out of a research think tank. It came out of um, more uh, kind of gurus, uh, Eastern, uh, the people who made it more popular here in the States were part of Eastern yeah, because mysticism. It's, it's been around for hundreds, thousands of years right. in different cultures. And so <clears throat> what, but what's interesting about the Enneagram that makes it different, and you can go to your Enneagram coach.com slash origins, where we have uh, number one presented our position on the question, but also presented three different podcast episodes talking about the origins talk. We've talked with some of the teachers that were here back in the seventies and eighties that whenever it started to get popular here in the States and the way in which to think about it, oftentimes people think about, and it's usually from a distance, they wonder if there's some kind of occult practice that, that comes along with the Enneagram, and there isn't. The Enneagram is simply a way of organizing these uh, behaviors, common behaviors, and then assigning type to them. Uh, that's it. There's no other spiritual exercise mm -hmm. tied to it. Now, what's interesting is that the after those initial people who brought the Enneagram to the United States, they ended up teaching a variety of different people. Uh, one of the, namely, um, uh, Naranjo was a guy's name, and he was a uh, professor. And so he taught his students and his students end up taking the Enneagram, but teaching it from their own worldview. And so there, uh, Richard Rohr was kind of in that vein and he came, he wasn't a student, but kind of a next generation teacher. Well, he applied it to Catholic mysticism. Uh, other people like Rizzo and Hudson applied it to secular psychology um, and others applied their worldview. And so when we use the Enneagram, we use it within the framework of creation, fall, redemption, consummation of what is man, what is his problem, what's the solution, and what's the hope to come, yeah, so where we only teach from a world a Christian worldview. It's kind of like when I was um, in college many moons ago, and I took my ethics class that I needed. Um, my professor was a uh, atheist, and now listening to him, you know, obviously I can try, I can like, oh, I want to follow that. Or I can go, what is it about that from a biblical perspective that's wrong? And how do I want to think about it differently? And that's what we've done with this tool is that we don't align ourselves with a lot of um, the ways that some of the Enneagram teachers have. And we're very clear with that. Um, but those things that are true, we know are God's truth. And so we want to focus in on that, but make sure that we're always helping people to see the finished work of Christ and how that applies to them. Yeah, super helpful. Um, and then maybe this this needs to be our last uh, question. Um, but I thought I thought this person worded it pretty well, so I'll just kind of kind of read it as it is. Um, can you talk a little bit more about growth and just we've named this hope for growth. Um, and uh, so being formed into the image of Christ and becoming more like him and less like me, um, but still being my specific personality. Um, yeah. So how, how can we um, think about growth and that um, sort of being transformed more and more into mm -hmm. the image of Christ um, as, in terms of our personality? Well, uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, Serge's cross chart. Yeah. I mean, I, I cannot tell you how helpful that particular tool is, but you can cross chart each Enneagram type. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and here's what that looks like is that every type. Too bad we is, don't have a whiteboard. That, oh I man, know. I would love to start drawing a cross <laughs> chart right now. Um, but each type has a way in which they perform in which, and also the way in which they pretend or deny. 
we have blind spots to certain character defects, and we also have strategies that we pursue to feel more secure in our relationship with Christ and others. And but there, but here's what's so insight, what's so insightful about the Enneagram is that we're not just talking about all Christians, we're talking about a specific personality type. So a nine's way of performing or uh, adhering their heart to the law, let's say, put in that language, is going to look different than a type eight. It's going to look different than a type one. But the way in which they have uh, experienced their blind spots and don't want to address the sin in their life is going to be unique to that type. Yeah. They have various strategies. But the reality is, is that each Enneagram type, because of their inherent liabilities and their strengths, where we even know, even using our gifting, we still need faith is coming alive to Christ in new ways. And so, you know, when we think of Paul and ending his life with the idea that I, I'm the chief of sinners, but God intended to use me so that many might believe, there is the promise of each Enneagram type that as we come alive more to Christ, our strategies to either pretend or perform actually diminish and we become more alive to Christ and its expression of faith, hope, and love. And I would just say, you know, so like we've got, you know, a book for each type, the Enneagram collection, our Becoming Us book, and then we have lots of other courses. So it's funny, you're pointing up, I'm like, oh, that's right, there's journals <laughs> right behind here. us. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, and so we really do map. I've got mine out. right here. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and we map out specifically what it looks like for that type to understand themselves first and foremost, but then how to grow while applying the gospel to your own heart. And I think the last thing I would, I would want to say to that question, I don't know if they worded it this way, but I do think a lot of people think this in the Christian faith is like, well, how can I get out of the way? How can I get rid of my personality and become just like Jesus? And I think that's just a false assumption. Jesus created you to be you. Now he wants you to be the healthiest Christ honoring uh, lookalike to him but he created you to be your type. And so we want to honor him through that creation by aligning our heart with the truth of the gospel and allowing the overflow to bless others exactly the way he wanted. So don't diminish yourself because then you're diminishing the creation yeah, that I, God has. You're, you're speaking to something true there because what Christ is inviting us to die to is the, uh, the, flesh, the fleshly self, right? the old self, um, the, the misaligned the false self, the misaligned self, and to come alive because you know as, as Peter talks about that we become instruments of grace in its various forms, and so there is a uniqueness to our sense of personhood that God mm -hmm. does not want us to turn away from, but that who He has made us to be, we need to come alive to by faith. Yeah. That identity comes outside of us through who Christ has called us to be and not something that we just create ourselves. The Enneagram simply just gives language to what God has already done. Yeah. I, you know, we could probably uh, come up with a part two and a part three and a part four <laughs> webinar sure. um, based on how many questions we got. Um, oh, that's so fun. Um, yeah. So many questions and I'm so sorry. We didn't have time to answer them all, um, but do want to just encourage folks to go to um, the yourenneagramcoach.com website. Uh, there are loads of resources there, um, and um, you know, not to mention you know blogs and podcasts and YouTube videos. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's great. That's so, great. For folks whatever want, however you want to consume it we have it <laughs> however you want to learn more um you know some folks said like oh i've heard about wings you know what is that um, yes that's and right. so that's that's a whole other um part of, of of kind of delving into this and learning more so um so just know that there are tons of resources out there and um you know at, at least for you guys uh your resources we feel confident that they are really steeped in the gospel that that um, you know, you you consistently point uh, to Jesus as you know th this drives us to Him when we're yes. like, ah, That's how right. do I change? Um, but yes. He's the only one who can change us. So, yep. um, yes. just thank you um, for being here with us. Um, and then um, maybe we can put up our slides. Um, great. So. Um,
so yeah, just just pointing out um, that you know folks will get the the link to download becoming us book, um, and then um, just that uh, the marriage assessment that's available at becomingus.com, um, and and just to point out, you know, this isn't just for married couples. Um, you know, anybody that you know, you, this is a, a you know strong relationship for you that you want to invest in. Um, and, and one maybe. brief thing about the becoming us book in the back of the book are eight page summaries that are extensive summaries of each Enneagram type and who they are in relationships. Yeah. And so there's a lot of your questions are going to be answered in the second section of that book. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Um, so if, if you're single and, um, you know, we still encourage you to, to download the book and, and take a look because um, there's, there's lots of resources um, in there. And then just a couple of surge resources that uh, you might want to check out as well. Um, you know, so much of what uh, we've talked about today uh, does have to do with our identity in Christ and what it means to understand ourselves as God does in light of the cross. Um, so if you'd like to delve into that idea more deeply in scripture, um, you can start with these surge books. Um, these can be used either for personal study or in your small group. Um, so first, gospel identity, and this is part of our um, gospel transformation series, um, and it's just a great study for those who want to understand the sort of theological framework for our identity in Christ, and then learn more about how his grace um, doesn't just renew us, uh, but it, it moves through us and outward uh, to love others. Um, and then second, uh, just feeling like, you know, the book of Ephesians, um, it, you know, is, is just a great place to sort of um, sit and marinate uh, and, and kind of think about everything that Christ has done for us um, and, and who that makes us, uh, who we are because of, of him. Um, and then how we kind of, you know, as we begin to um, you know, take that uh, knowledge and truth on board, how that um, helps us um, in our relationships, how it, it really shapes all of our relationships um, and interactions with others. So just encourage you to check those out if you get a chance. Um, and lots of folks said like, whoa, they're going too fast um, <laughs> through, the, through the slides. Um, so we can, we can provide those um, for folks in the, in the follow-up email. Uh, there will be a link to the recording so you can watch it again. You can share it with your friends who couldn't be here today. Um, so, uh, you will get an email chock full of, of, uh, stuff from this webinar. Um, and then we just, you know, as we're on the, uh, cusp of the Lenten, uh, season, um, Serge wanted to share just a special gift that we'll also include in that email. Um, it's, it's a copy of a Lenten study guide, um, that again, you can use in personal study or with your small group over the six weeks of Lent. Um, and we just pray it helps you make uh, some space this season to, to just receive God's love given to us through Jesus' death um, and connect that love to your time and your heart and your resources and his heart for the world. Um, so we really hope you'll enjoy that. Uh, we're not quite ready to announce our next webinar, um, but as soon as we are, you'll, you'll hear about that in a, in a subsequent email. And as always, if you want to learn more about Surge, whether it's, you know, these renewal resources, uh, our full webinar archive, if you just want to watch webinars all day, uh, they're all available for you on our website. Um, or if you're, you know, kind of curious about some uh, current missions opportunities around the world, um, all that information is available on surge.org. Um, you're always welcome to reach out to us in the renewal department at grow at surge.org um, with any questions about our programs or resources. And from all of us at Surge, um, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye for now.